We are live. Hi, and welcome to our Friday webinar, um, our special guest today. So today we have the University Vet Insider, teaching, treating, and research with Dr. Jorg Meyer. Welcome, Dr. Meyer. Thank you for coming Thanks for having and joining me. us on a Friday, hopefully, um, from University of He's a professor from the University of Georgia, so College of Veterinary Medicine, and um, you do all the some wonderful, the, the animals that, that truly need a loving, caring vet, the small animals and exotics, right? That's right. That's right. Everything that is not a dog or a cat, but lives in your house. That's right. So we're not talking horses then, right? Because they're... Yeah. Neck, neck. Well, yeah, no. Yeah. Well, but I mean, sometimes, you know, we get the odd call, somebody has a zebra or whatever so or you know in the older days traveling circus was coming through town so stuff like this yeah nice okay that is interesting we'll have to touch upon that during this uh, <laughs> webinar because i want to i want to know about the the exotic of the most the most exotic of the exotics of the exotics that you've treated or seen cool um so let's see i was just going to remind our um our, our participants today, the ones who are joining in with us, that um, we're going to actually do like a free form uh, interview here with Dr. Meyer. So if you have some questions, um, typically on our webinars, we'd have you we'd have you type them in for us um, at the end to, to ask. But we'll, we'll see if we can um, funnel some through as we as we as we do this. So uh, just as a reminder, though, of course, is to use the Q&A button and not the chat feature. So um, so you are so where where in the world are you right now, Dr. Meyer? What state? Uh, well, with, I'm, I'm, this is this is uh, this is part of my home here in Georgia. So uh, I thought it's um, it's nicer than in my office. So I a lot of creative juices flow at home instead of like the. Uh, so I'm surrounded by my little dogs that I just kicked out. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, it's this is uh, this is where my tent is pitched at the moment. All right. All right. So the University of Georgia, that's the Bulldogs. Um, you don't treat the Bulldog because he's not an exotic, right? Not he's exotic a... enough. That's right. That's right. No. <laughs> Does he get all this veterinary care when he's on? Because he's the dog mascot. He's veterinary yeah, school. I think he also comes with like always five lawyers attached to him. So yeah, because he's so important. So uh, I let other people deal with that. So yeah. Oh, and a security personnel because, you know, the like private schools, they do that with the mascots. So big, big deal here. Big deal. <laughs> Try to think of it. I don't think there's any universities that have like a parrot mascot that I can think of, like cardinals and other birds, but not necessarily parrots yeah. or. No, yeah, yeah not the, the beautiful hyacinth macaw. No, like but yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> all right, let's see here. As we so I think as we have people log in, can you give us a little bit of background um, on you know where you're from, like you know a little bit about you that. Sure. A little, uh, little York to, to today's York. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, well, as you can hear from my accent, I grew up in uh, New Jersey mainly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from Germany. Uh, I grew up I grew up in Germany, and um, uh, yeah, where I, where I went through my primary education, um, and then I had to join the army, so it was still mandatory. And while I was in the army, the Berlin Wall fell. Uh, exciting times. The Cold War was officially over. And uh, I was very worried that communism is going to die out like a, like a dinosaur. And I really wanted to experience this. So I, I just talked to my parents. I said, I want to live. I want to live in the East. I want to go to the East. And, and my dad, my both, my, my dad and my mom were super supportive of that idea. And so my dad said something. Oh, I heard you can study human medicine in, uh, in Hungary. And I'm like, oh, close, but I can't see blood. So not really happening. And so we called up the embassy and I said, oh, yeah, we just started a veterinary program in Hungary. And so the, uh, I applied, I got in and my plan was to maybe stay there for a year or two and then move further back, move going to back west. And I just fell in love with everything. I mean, um, it was just it was just so idyllic. I mean, to give you an example, all my professors were fluent in five languages minimum. Right. There were all these like senior gray-haired gentleman and uh, and the education was very paramilitaristically so you had to show up to classes uh you know they knew exactly if you wouldn't go uh multiple tests and all the tests were oral so there was no multiple choice exam it was all kind of like you had to dress up like you would go to a wedding or something like formal cool. dress with tie yeah. and then you would sit in front of the professor and they would just quiz you 
until they found holes to poke into. You. So it was just like a nice conversation. I mean, not so nice, maybe for him and or her entertaining. But so, I, but basically, I yes, I, I did really love that environment. The city is beautiful. Uh, cost of living were amazing at the time. Um, and so then I decided, you know what, before I take this uh, job and and don't see the daylight anymore in the salt mines, uh, I thought, you know what, I'm going to go and volunteer for three months. I'm going to go to the States and uh, volunteer at the zoo and um, just, you know, uh, see what how people do medicine here in the States. And uh, yeah, and that was like about 25 years ago, 26 years ago, the longest three months of my life. <laughs> so uh, I did, I volunteered at the zoo in Rhode Island. And uh, after a couple of weeks, I guess they liked me and I said, you know what, uh, do you want to do this for a whole year and be our intern and get paid for it? And so I said, yeah, that's cool. And, uh, and so I did that. And um, then at the end of this, that was really cool because they had, uh, they had a conservation research team. And so uh, they went actually to Papua New Guinea to study um, tree kangaroos, among others. And so then they took me along and um, that was really amazing. And that was really where I figured out that field research is not my cup of tea. <laughs> so living in the tent for uh, weeks and weeks where after a couple of weeks, you don't have a piece of dry clothes because the mildew is growing, the moisture. And we were really high up. We were in cloud forest. So, so very, very high up jungle it took us over two days to hike into that research site um and beautiful birds uh you know bird of paradise um uh cassowary uh stuff is really really cool uh for lots of birders go to new guinea to you know uh as a highlight there but um after a while kind of like eating rice and greens that were just plucked off a tree and our the highlight was having a can of fish here and there once a week. Um, and like I said, um, not being able to find a dry piece of cloth anywhere. The only place where you were able to heat up was the evening campfires. Um, but also the dogs would huddle around because it was so cold and it always rained. The <laughs> cloud forest uh, humidity was 120% on a regular basis. And so then you would get fleas from the dog sitting next to your their campfire. So uh, at one time I had probably over 80 flea bites on one leg. I stopped counting. Oh my gosh. Um, and then you're hiking through the rainforest there and then you remove leeches from any kind of body parts. And, you know, I mean, it sounds all great. And when you watch the special on National Geographic and, you know, right here, we see the majestic <laughs> lyrebird. Sounds great from the sofa, but being in that situation for weeks and weeks and weeks, yeah, it was great. I'm, I'm, I'm really, I love it that I did it. Um, but this is how I figured out I don't want to do that for a living. Um, Got that bucket so, list item off, right? Yeah, and then I, you know, I thought, well, I still wasn't sure 100 percent what I want to do. That internship was really great. It was in a zoo, so uh, I dealt with a lot of exotic species there. And um, but being a zoo veterinarian is. Um, there's a lot of paperwork involved, a lot of meetings and stuff like this. Uh, and it's also a little bit paramilitaristically kind of organized because you're dealing with a lot of dangerous animals. Um, so you always have people in the room that, you know, maybe even carry a gun if it's a dangerous animal like a polar bear that are known to wake up from anesthesia, right? So, and it has to be, it has to be really well planned out. You know exactly who is doing anesthesia, who is monitoring this, who is doing in this and there's a lot of um uh there's a lot of um anxiety associated with it and and sometimes you know and so i'm like hey, you know what this is cool but maybe this is not what i want to do for the next 30 years of my life either so so basically i ruled out quite a few things that i didn't want to do so but i didn't really know what i wanted to do so i heard about this master's uh program from the royal veterinary college in england and london and so I applied for it and oddly enough, I got in again. And, and it was within that program where I figured out kind of like, you know what, um, academia sounds really cool. Uh, I want to do a little bit of research. Um, and uh, so I had to do my master's thesis and I did it uh, 
with wild because it was obviously masters in wild animal health. And so I did it on the common loon. Um, and so based uh, from, from my past experience being up in Rhode Island, uh, when we had a case that was a little bit more involved, we would bring our animals up to Tufts University. Uh, and they're really well known and they're really uh, famous for their great wildlife clinic there. And so I, um, I thought, hey, what about if I, if I work um, there and have, uh, and have my master thesis done in cooperation with that wildlife clinic? So we, I ended up uh, going there, being there, and I did it on the common loon, uh, which are beautiful birds up in New England there. And, uh, and so basically I just looked at if there was any correlation between lead toxicity um, and uh, aspergillosis. So we had a lot of loons uh, that were necropsied where they looked at uh, lead findings mm -hmm. uh, from mainly, they, they get it from old uh, sinkers from fishermen that either drop uh, lead weights uh, or were, um, you know, like even even buckshot or, or, or something like this where, where then there's a lot of lead in the environment. Uh, but the loons usually eat it uh, from either sinkers or something like this. And so then I tried to see if aspergillosis, that fungal disease uh, in them, had something, if we could predict, if we can say, hey, these, these animals with high amount of lead have a more severe uh, form of aspergillosis. So there was a lot of going through records, going through old records from necropsy, uh, and then we also did a little bit um, at the time, this was brand new GPS coordinates. So we tried to log in, see hotspots if there was any environmental contamination. So, so it was evolved, kept me going. And then it turns out that while I was doing my master's up there, they were actually looking for uh, a faculty um, to run their exotic service. And, and to be honest, I really never thought that I had a chance. Um, but what I thought is like, hey, when this master's program is over, I really need to apply for a job. Uh, you know, I need to get a job. So why don't I use that opportunity to just practice how to interview for a job? And uh, I thought I'd throw my hat in the ring, not, you know, not, not getting my hopes up or anything. Just, you know, how is a job interview? How, you know, how nervous am I going to get? And the cool thing was, um, because I looked at it that way, I wasn't nervous at all because to me it was just like fun. It was an exercise. And I don't know if that kind of like transcended or something like this. It was like, oh, he's really cool. Because I, I don't know, but to my shocking surprise, a week later or something like this, they offered me the job there. And so I was like, oh, really? That was one of the very few moments in my life where I was truly speechless when I got that phone call. I'm like, wow. What? So, um, yeah, and needless to say, I took it. And, and so I stayed there for 10 years. Um, so their exotic service uh, at the time was non-existent. So they hired me to basically build it up because their previous veterinarian left, like, I think, three or four years before. And the students really, really wanted to get more. So that's why I'm always grateful to veterinary students because they really made my first job come to life because I think they kept complaining and says, hey, we're paying a lot of money here to get educated in veterinary medicine and nobody teaches us really how to restrain a bird, how to you know take blood and stuff. And so it was due to the pressure that the students exerted that I got my first job. And so, yeah, I stayed there for 10 years, uh, learned a lot. Uh, and then uh, UGA made me an offer I just couldn't refuse. And uh, we talked it through my wife and I because she's from New England too, and so, and so said, so, you know what? Let's just take a look at uh, what UGA has to offer, and and we both love it here. So we've been here for eleven years, and um, it's great. We just love the South, and uh, yeah. So I'm, that's that, that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> so so Dr. Meyer, um, just a question going back to well, first of all, you you worked with Castries. Is that the the really deadly well, bird? No, that's you in the news that. Did you yeah, see them? You know, that's that's exciting thing. You you know you you really um, don't work with cassowaries because they're like as most of, of people here know they're like the most dangerous bird out there, uh, right? So, but what what was to me what was it still see it in my mind, which was a really great experience. Um, so when when we hiked uh, into uh, two days. Uh, up and down, up and down. I mean, it, it was crazy. The, the blisters on my feet, whatever. It was crazy. So, so anyway, we hiked up into that cloud forest, 
Um, and so the, the organization, the conservation uh, idea was that in Papua New Guinea, more than 95% of the land is still owned by traditional landowners, by clans, by families. So the vast majority of this is, um, you know, still very, very naturalistic habitat. Fantastic from a conservation point of view, fantastic dream. And so our research director at the zoo, um, she, had, uh, she has been going there on a regular basis already. But this was the first time then that veterinarians joined the team. And so the idea that she was able to communicate um, to the landowners there said, hey, what about this? Um, what about, because um, the, the main protein source for the people that are living off the land are small mammals and birds that they hunt. The, the vast majority of, of their diet is vegetarian and, and, you know, like they have some garden veggie gums and stuff, but, but the animal protein is basically coming from hunting. Um, and so, so the idea of the conservation project was like, hey, if we get a whole bunch of landowners together um, and then we, we get them to agree that they set a certain amount of land uh, apart from the hunting that they basically don't go into it and they consider it kind of like these these regeneration zone that if if they're hunting an animal and that animal animal escapes into that across that defined a border that then you back out of it um and uh, the idea was that then the animals actually migrate there have kids uh, populate and then they will migrate out of this and anything that is surplus that migrates out of it it's fair game to hunt so so that conservation idea was immediately adopted by them and so we were talking to one of the one of the main chiefs that was responsible that he was kind of like the spokesperson for quite a few families and the clan and uh, he showed us one day he got super excited because we were out doing our research and he got really excited and I had no idea what was going on. He was looking at the floor, at the ground, and there was this pile of mud, in my opinion. And he got, he looked at it and, and he obviously immediately uh, talked and talked pidgin, their, their language to everybody. And, and I could just see how everybody got excited. And, and I was like, what's going on? And he said, oh, this is cassowary feces. <laughs> so, and he said, he has never seen a cassowary. He's only heard from his grandfather uh, about them hunting cassowaries. Uh, but he has never really seen them. That's how rare they got. And now the fact that they see feces, cassowary feces, is a clear sign that they migrated back into that, into that conservation zone. And so to me, I, I, like I said, I, I still clearly remember that excitement and also that proof of concept that look, that whole idea of setting that land aside and nature will appreciate it and and the species will recognize this very quickly that this is this is the place where we won't be disturbed and and so that that was that was one of the great moments um to really see conservation in action work um and uh, yeah so that, that so and, yeah. and they told us a couple of cassavera stories which would take another podcast but yeah no i didn't work with them but I was in their native habitat. I came really close, uh, <laughs> and and luckily I didn't get closer because maybe I would have a couple of scars to uh, <laughs> to tell more interesting stories. But yeah, yeah for that, the that record, really they, for the record, they have those um, scissor like like talons, right? The, the yeah, they're kind of like I mean, they're aggressive. You see them, <laughs> yeah, they're really aggressive. And what they do is they, um, you know, they're kind of like if you wanna. If you want to compare them, they're kind of like an emu or rhea on steroids. But um, you know, maybe an emu or rhea, you can go to like, ha, 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 and they run the other, they run the other way. They take off versus the castle where it doesn't buy into this. They'll charge you right away. They they make a beeline for you, and then again, they can't fly. But what they do, they jump up and kick you with one of these velociraptor legs and then they have this huge huge claw and they literally slit their opponents open um and that's usually in new guinea when when people here there was a there was a uh, cassowary encounter it usually means they're preparing a funeral for someone so because that's um it's it's tough wow. it, it, they're, they're tough birds they're very aggressive so this is why 
you know, I'm, I'm kind of like, okay, seeing the feces and, uh, you know, I don't want to <laughs> get too much just... closer in the wild. <laughs> so you wanted to know, speaking of the, um, the conservation uh, area borders, were they honored? Did they, so when they created them, did they, did they honor those areas, like those borders? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, like, again, and that, you know, that evidence of, uh, that they saw, uh, was, was like that cassowary feces what was was to them evidence so it wasn't kind of like something that you know it was an abstract idea that it took like two generations for them to understand it was it was the whole concept was very fruitful they completely and and that was many years that was over 20 years ago um and and, and that concept uh is still that 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 area just mushroomed because these landowners were then talking to other landowners where hey we're we're working with this concept do you want to and so that conservation area is, is still growing to this day that it's, it's a really really great uh, research project i think you can find out they have a really great homepage. It's the tree kangaroo conservation project and uh dr daybeck uh is i think still in woodland park zoo now um and so uh, they have a good web page and you can read all about it. So they're using the tree kangaroo as a flagship species because it's one of the largest mammal in New Guinea there. It's a very enigmatic animal, but they're obviously protecting the, the, these huge areas of land and they do a lot of uh, censuses where literally biologists and researchers move through to catalog um, like all the species. And um, if, if any of the, uh, it's not listeners, it's how to say, uh, watchers now, what, what are Analysts? we support? Uh, yeah. what? The people you, are, some of those panelists. you out there if you are if you're interested and if you're really interested in this uh you know um you may want to also look at tim flannery tim flannery is an australian biologist who's uh, who, who spent a lot of times living in uh, and researching in new guinea so he wrote quite a few books on that uh fascinating stuff out there so yeah we could i could fill a whole <laughs> uh, webinar with my time in New Guinea, right. which was which there we was go. We'll book order. it. We'll book it for later in the year then, uh -oh. or, yeah, or for early next year. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Dr. so speaking of like um, aggressive birds, like okay, so I'm I'm imagining you you have uh, veterinary students that come in. Um, are they are what percentage of them decide like, hey, I I, I don't think uh, like the exotics are like maybe they have a sudden bird phobia they didn't realize they had when it comes to like the hands-on stuff do, do they do they pretty much stick it out like do people change their major or change their mind very often or is it something that they've come in with the mindset that hey i want to be an exotic vet yeah so um uh, great question um it's that great of a question that i don't think i can answer it okay <laughs> so so because no i, I, I explain you why so um the way how the way how uh, at least at, at our university um, it's structured is like so um, we have we have courses that deck the courses right so the first three years are mainly uh, for the students are mainly sitting um, behind a desk or nowadays at home with Zoom um, and we lecture to them right we'll give a material so there's very little hands on uh, they're trying to change that but tr traditionally. Uh, the first three years are kind of like textbook learning, getting your foundations. And then the fourth year you spend in the, in, in the hospital as your clinical rotation. So, so our, our veterinary school has blocks of three weeks. So you spend three blocks, for example, on surgery. Then you rotate out of surgery. You spend three weeks on emergency. Then you do emergency care. Then you do three weeks on ophthalmology, dealing with eye problems, right? And so there are certain blocks um, that are absolutely a must. Every student, so these are core, these are considered core rotations. Every student has to take them, no matter what your interest is. And then there is elective rotations. And elective rotations, um, it's up to you. You can tailor them. They still need to be approved by a committee. But so basically, our world, zoological medicine, is an elective rotation, which means that I don't get to teach hands on. Um, every veterinary student that goes through uh, the university system. I only get to teach those who really want this, right? And so that's how I prefer it too. And so when, when sometimes there's a curriculum review and people ask us, well, you guys get, uh, you know, like, would you guys 
like to be a, a core rotation? And I'm like, no, because I really don't want to work with a student that doesn't feel comfortable holding a bird or okay. doesn't feel right, because then it's just going to be dangerous for everybody. So, however, I can I can work really happily with a student that wants to learn how to hold a bird, but hasn't done so, right? So because they're teachable, right? And they maybe in the beginning, we, uh, you know, the staff, the, the technician, maybe the house officers, the residents and intern, maybe they'll have to teach him a couple of times. Look, this is how you get a bird off the perch. This is how you do kind of like fear free uh, exam. And then we'll see how that student progresses. And then we say, hey, what about the next one? Do you want us? And, and so this is why I can't really answer your questions, how many of them, because I okay. only work with the ones that really want to do it. Okay. And speaking of the birds that they would, if they really want to do it, that they would be handling, are those, um, are those uh, you know, people might not realize that, that they can bring their, their companion bird into a vet clinic or a vet school for treatment is, um, is that something that, uh, so let's say your bird has a, a medical issue and um, you're near a, a veterinary hospital that's that's somewhat within driving distance. Is that something that, is that more like an, I imagine some of the, the, um, the work that you guys do might be more cutting edge and um, as opposed to, because you're a learning hospital, is that? Yeah, so, uh, so both, both. So um, I, I kind of, I kind of like the setup how it is. So basically you can call, you can pick up the phone and say, Hey, I got a um, cockatiel. I got a cockatoo. I got da, 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 da. Uh, can, can I book an appointment? The default answer is absolutely yes. You know, it's like, yeah, we got a, we got a specialty service that, that is specifically made there to cater to your needs and we'll do anything. We'll do a beak and nail trim for you. Uh, and uh, we'll do a CT scan and do surgery and whatever. So, so that's the beauty. So um, the reason why we're not doing a lot of beak and nail trim is just uh, probably that for these kind of services, these primary services, we're probably pricing ourselves a little bit out of the market. So mm -hmm. by default, when you book an appointment, our appointment is usually an hour long. Okay, so versus in private practice, you might get to spend 15, 20 minutes. I, I, to be honest, I don't know what the current time frame is of appointments out there. So we have, we have our appointments. It's just the, the name of the game because, again, we're an educational facility. Mm -hmm. uh, but also a lot of the time uh, is we dealing with more complicated cases. So most of the times when people bring their pets to the university, it's that sometimes maybe we had a second or a third veterinarian already like trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, uh, the infrastructure that, that a university hospital has to carry along is amazing. I mean, if you've ever gone to like a university clinic and, and, and you know, most, I mean, our university has an open, open house once a year where the general public can get to so which is, really interesting public loves it but you get to see a little bit behind the scene and you get an appreciation uh what kind of machinery it takes to operate a hospital um sometimes maybe people don't um, appreciate this but you know we have a ct scanner we have an mri so very advanced imaging which you know to purchase those cost already a couple million dollars to purchase them and then addition uh, these are these are high tech, high, very sensitive equipment um, that uh, you know require maintenance contracts. Where the technician then comes in, uh, lots of stuff there is moving, uh, and and like, these are delicate, delicate machines. And you know a service contract, you know, costs maybe twenty, thirty thousand dollars. So uh, just to give you an idea of what huge infrastructure is at a teaching facility. And um, and sometimes people are under this impression that, um, oh, here, uh, why don't you offer your service for free, your teaching institution? It's like, well, you know, in an ideal world, there would be no wars. <laughs> Everybody would love each other and we would do stuff for free. Right. So. So, yeah. But so um, that's why a lot of times, like I said, we kind of like pricing ourselves a little bit out of the beak and nail trim. Uh, 
yeah. um, situation because you can get this done significantly cheaper at the referring. And and to be honest, I like that setup because it uh, I. You know, I don't want the university to be direct competition with the local practitioners. I, I like to work with them as a team, um, you know, and then a lot of times, you know, I mean, every day I spend time on the phone talking to a local practitioner. They said, hey, can I just quickly pick your brain? I got this bird and, and da, 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 this is the scenario. What would you do? And I say, hey, have you done this and this? Or maybe you want to take more blood and send for this test. So, so and then eventually he says, you know what, maybe I'll send it to you. I'm like, okay, but you know, make sure that the owner brings all the medical records that if you guys already took blood work or took blood for blood work, if you took a radiograph, bring that with you. The more information I have, then the better I can help the, that case too, that we don't have to repeat the same thing. So, and, and that's a great relationship. I like to do it. Um, and a lot of times we get very exciting cases that way. Oh, that's great. So you, you do some uh, almost like teaching and collaboration with local veterinarians. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, that that's part of the that's part of the teaching process. Like, absolutely. And and that's why we usually encourage our student and one of those electives, they can pick and choose where they're going. And so a lot of a lot of the students do actually pick local private practitioners with either a high, a very high caseload of exotic cases or, you know, if it's available, uh, exclusively exotic uh, caseload because to them that's attractive. Um, and, you know, I've seen, I've, I've seen a huge shift. I've seen a huge shift from, from, I mean, I guess I've been doing this for over 20 years um, now, close to 25 years now, that, uh, you know, in the beginning that exotic thing was a little bit kind of like, yeah, that's sort of crazy. You know, that's for like, who wants to do that? You know, and now, um, you know, it, it's kind of standard. It's it's kind of standard for a veterinary clinic to be able to give advice, at least, uh, you know, a rabbit, a ferret, an iguana, a cockatiel, because they're so common. Um, they might not be able to offer, you know, significant uh, stuff, but they a lot of times they're able to differentiate. It's like, oh, look, this is something that you may want to see a specialist, or this is something that, oh, I think this animal... You know, maybe why don't we start with a blood draw or why don't we do it with imaging and, and go from there? So, yeah, it has become, well, I don't want to say mainstream, but the percentage of veterinarians out there of clinics in the field um, that do see exotic pets to a certain degrees is, is significantly higher. And that's, and that's what I tell my students. Like, uh, I just this morning, I gave a lecture in our in our dermatology elective. So it's basically a whole course on dermatology, which is mainly the itchy dog and itchy cat, right? Because mm -hmm. the vast majority of them, but clearly there is an hour on exotic animal medicine. So, and I told them, I said, listen, don't forget about your, um, all that knowledge that you're learning about dog and cat, just because we're talking about a different species doesn't mean your logical thinking has to go out the window. And so I basically just taught them how to basically think a little bit differently. So if it has scales, if it has feathers, it still has a skin, right? It still can be, it still can be, it still can be itchy, you know, you know, uh, so, so, and you're thinking the kind of questions that you need to ask is very similar. Could this be an ectoparasite? Could this be fleas? Could that be nutritionally related, right? All that works exactly the same. And those new graduates that apply for positions out there that, that are joining private practices, man, the moment they say, I feel comfortable seeing that cockatiel, I feel comfortable seeing that rabbit, yeah. you know, they, you know they, a couple of doors just opened, right? Because a lot of practice owners say, oh my God, that's fantastic. Why don't you join our team? Because we do see more and more birds, reptiles, mammals. So it's, it's always a plus. Oh, that's great. No, it's funny. I see some some clinics near me when I'm driving around um, that'll say um, animal um, medicine and bird. <laughs> I like the birds, like the the ampersand tag on, and so they must have a a vet that that they that's specifically treating birds and exotics. Yeah. So it's interesting because I mean, I you know I noticed that too that 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 expression. So um, you know, it's kind of like city veterinarian or all pets plus birds i'm like yeah. no like all pets that, that's already what you said because birds are pets but i think a clinic that's communicating this that has that and birds i think they're using the birds as um as a placeholder for oh we are happy to see exotic 
So, um, so there's very, there's very few of them uh, when they say, you know, all cre or, or your city veterinarian and birds, that if you would have a rabbit or an iguana that they, that they don't say this. The moment that they, are, um, that they um, have birds on there, that means that they're probably comfortable with all exotics. Okay, okay. That's a lot of different body systems to, to deal with. Oh. Compared oh to yeah, I mean, that's why you don't want to call me. That's why it's usually, it's really funny at a cocktail party or at the airport or whatever. I was like, you're a veterinarian? Yeah, I'm a veterinarian. And they immediately start asking me about the dogs and cats question. I'm like, sorry, don't know about that. I can't help you. And they look at me like, what? I thought you're a veterinarian. It's like, yeah, but I don't do dogs and cats. And they look at me and they're like, is he trying to pull me? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm my my big dog wants, I lost him out and he wants to come in. So I just All have right. to get him in. The little down. girls, let, let me, okay, the little girls are coming. I apologize because sometimes they do a little bit growly, but hey, that's, uh, that's the life of a veterinarian, right? There you go, there you go. But you probably All could right. do some basic treatment on your he dog is, there. <laughs> he has my big dog. And here's one of the little, uh, two of the little. Oh, you got there twins. we go. Come on, come on, up on the left. There we go. You can be part of it. Nice. That, so. Okay. Okay. Um, and so, and, and just real quick, as we're going, you mentioned about the, the, um, the equipment that, that the learning hospital has. And um, on the other part of that would be a medicine, medications. You guys are at the forefront of developing perhaps some medications that, that um, when you go to your local vet, you eventually hopefully will have access to or be in the market to, to treat your pet. Is that something that you guys are work on uh, the actual medications that treat our exotic? So, yeah, so basically what we don't do, what we can do because the day just doesn't have too many hours is we're not kind of like having a little secret kitchen where we cook up medications, right? So we, we, we don't do this, but there's so much medication coming out that is approved for dogs and cats, humans, we are, we are also allowed you know, to prescribe human medications versus an MD is not allowed to prescribe pet medication. <laughs> so, so we use a lot of, uh, you know, stuff like Lipitor, for example, we use in some pets and stuff like this. So, but, um, so what we do, what we spend uh, a lot of our days scratching our heads and say, okay, so we just diagnosed a condition uh, that is either common or rare in a dog or a cat or a human. And if that would be a cat, uh, we would use this in this medication. So can we use that in the Amazon? Can we use this in the cockatiel, right? And so that's, that's a lot of times where we're involved in like trying to figure out, is that a safe drug? Uh, if yes, uh, you know, what is the right level? What is the, what is the right level? Um, I mean, just to give you an example, so uh, there's, a, there's a very popular drug, uh, it's called Pimobendin, which is used for uh, uh, cardiac insufficiency, heart failure, in, and obviously comes all from humans too, but it's approved for dogs and cats. And, um, and so it's very popular because it's a very safe medication. And, um, and um, so just to give you an idea, a lot of times it's being used. So we use uh, uh, our, our unit, I always think, God, how, how good the human doctors got it. You go to your office, you know, whatever they diagnose you, yeah, take one of those red pills, right? No matter if that human is twice the size of me or half the size of me, ah, it's the little pill there. And I'm like, shouldn't the big guy take two pills and the little guy take half a pill? Yeah, that's not how it works. Everybody gets a bit. So for us, because we have this amazing size difference, we go always by milligram per kilogram, right? So you have to look at how much active ingredient usually expressed in milligram is in that capsule so you have maybe a tablet that contains five milligram or 25 milligram and then you got to weigh your bird or your exotic pet and then you got to calculate well you know a one one tablet would be 500 times the dose of a dog or a cat so oh my god so i have to make a suspension i have to make a solution right so dilute it with water but so using that pimo bendon example so in dogs and cats they use it something i think at 0.3 milligrams per kilogram. And in birds, we use it something like 10, 15. So when you talk to a cardiologist and say, hey, we are, you know, I need this pill or I need this drug, I'm scripting this out for this bird. And it's like, well, what do you use? And it's like 10 milligrams. Oh my God, they nearly have a heart attack because you know, that is a little so much more than they would use. But you know, 
that's what happens at the university. There's people that take birds that put them on these medications and then look for side effects or look for an effective dose, right? So maybe you start very low, you start with that dog and cat dose, and then you keep monitoring, do I see any improvement because I diagnosed this heart condition? Do I see any improvement? No, I don't. Well, why don't we give it twice a day, right? And so still nothing, you know? And then, well, why don't we give twice the dose twice a day? Okay, and eventually you'll be like, oh, oh, like I see, I see an improvement, right? Or there is uh, universities maybe that have research facilities and they can give animals that drug and then what they do is they place an IV catheter and then they pull blood every hour or so. They take a little bit of blood every hour and then they send it to a lab and then they do fancy analysis with it. Basically, what they do is they look at the drug, the active ingredient that is in the blood. Because we know from these other studies, again, starting with human studies and then some of them are dog and cat studies, we know what that concentration of that drug has to be in the blood for it to be effective, right? And that's a lot of times how these drugs that are kind of like new in parentheses for us, for bird medicine, for exotic, they're new. They're not new drugs, they're old drugs on the market, but they potentially haven't been really researched in a cockatiel or cockatoo. Yeah. And can you, I know that um, oh, some of the, for the companion pet medicine birds, is uh, oftentimes comes from the poultry industry. Is that correct? Yes, or... yes, yes, that's absolutely right. So basically, uh, and I guess nutrition is also big on the forefront. I'm sorry, I just got a computer down here. It's all like I have to reshuffle myself with the dogs on the lab. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it, yeah, it, it, especially the vast majority of, uh, of nutrition, right, is, is, is coming from the poultry industry. So, so and and so, you know, more and more, and there, there is books available, obviously, on avian nutrition, other than poultry and stuff like this. But the vast majority comes basically from a food animal production science, right? Where uh, um, you, you look at an animal, a cow, a pig, uh, a bird, a chicken, uh, because uh, it is it is an economic factor, right? I mean, that's the past. We've got to look where does uh, veterinary medicine, what's the history of veterinary medicine? And the first, why were the first veterinary colleges created uh, in Europe? Uh, well, to take care of the horses for the army, right? I mean, that was the sort the of first veterinary colleges were kind of like a hybrid between farrier school and kind of like, you know, uh like then veterinary veterinary medical thing and then what was the next thing that got taught in veterinary medicine like you know the cattle so then the agriculture stuff moved in right so uh, can we make the cow can we make the pig better right and then when poultry became an economic effect it's like oh we have now poultry experts right and so a lot of so that's an evolution from veterinary medicine so this is why just traditional and and, and georgia is huge georgia is one of the you know forefront uh, poultry research. Um, it's one of these big, big economic drivers. And I think it's, it's one of the biggest poultry producers in the United States. So I'm lucky enough that we have these amazing experts literally just across the street and um, that, that, you know, have their PhD in poultry diseases. So, and as, as you all know, that backyard poultry is, a, you, uh, is going through a huge renaissance and people love their chickens and, and ducks and stuff of these in the backyard. And and so whenever we have a, when we have a, have a, a case that where we have to scratch our heads, oh man, it's great. We can literally just like either pick up the phone or hop in the car and literally drive across the road and, um, and get expert opinion and like see what is the most reliable test, what is even worth testing for or what is not. Uh, and then even to bring it further clinical, we have used a lot of their, uh, their, their chickens that they have for blood donors. So if we have, uh, a cockatoo, if we have a macaw, a big bird, any bird that we go into surgery and we are worried that this could be a risky surgery or or maybe it got attacked by the dog or something. And we know there's blood loss. Either there has been blood loss or there will be blood loss. So we literally just go pick up the phone, say, hey, 
we need blood donor blood for avian blood donors. And so sure enough, we go over there 10 minutes later, we have 20 milliliters of fresh avian blood that we have on standby that we can either immediately transfuse to a critical patient or have on standby bring into surgery with us just in case you know, that surgery would be a little bit risky. So that, that it's a huge benefit. So you could have a parrot with um, chicken blood? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that's really interesting. So basically, and research has been done. So, and the take home message here is like, the closer the donor and the recipients are related, the longer the red blood cells will stay alive. So uh, can I give, owl blood to a cockatoo absolutely have we done this absolutely right so yeah we can do this but because they are very distantly related right um that means that that donor blood from the uh, from the owl is not going to survive very long in the cockatoo because the immune system kind of like realizes like yeah what's going on right i mean we know in, in human medicine we know we have different blood groups and you're not to mix the blood right i mean that's how sensitive we are yeah. So luckily we are, we are not there. So, but what's really cool about avian blood loss is that if we have an acute blood loss, let's say it got attacked by the dog or, or two birds, two cockatoos were going at it, right? Yeah. And, and there was blood loss. So, and we have this emergency or it's a surgery that there was acute blood loss. So we only need to bridge. The most important thing is to get this animal, this bird through the first 48 hours because within 48 hours, the bone marrow of the bird kicks in and produces blood again, right? That's the, that's the blood factory, the bone marrow. So we know very fast does this whole process happen. So if we can get this bird through the first 48 hours, the prognosis just significantly increased. And so this is why we might have to give two or three times a blood transfusion of maybe five milliliters slowly over a couple hours or something like this. But you know, it's much better giving whole blood is much better than just giving fluids or something like this. So that's why we like to do that a lot. And when you're talking blood loss in a bird, like say a cockatiel, it's a very little amount of blood that, that loss that can be harmful. Well, you know, so again, uh, it's kind of like my answer is not going to be like, yeah, you're right, because that would be too easy. Uh, so actually, it's really interesting. The answer is really interesting. So studies have been done in the 60s and um, uh, and so basically, so you hear this rumor a lot, you hear this a lot, you see, oh yeah, birds can't lose a lot of blood, they'll die quickly, which is actually false, which is actually completely false, right? Because again, you got to think about, you got, you got to bring it down to a baseline and the baseline is the body weight, right? So basically, if you boil it down to the definition of milliliter blood lost per kilogram body weight or gram body weight, you know, which is a percentage of the blood volume. So, so birds can actually stay alive with significant higher percentage of blood loss than any mammal. So if you artificially suck blood out of me or mammal and, you know, um, mammals collapse very quickly um you know you don't want you don't want to take 20 percent out of me so that that would be i would be kind of like close to a coma then but you know it has been shown in birth that they can lose up to 60 percent of their blood volume and they're like quack 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 maybe they're a little bit sleepy right they're a little bit tired but maybe they can withstand this because if they simmer down if they go into their you know kind of like oh i'm just going to regenerate mode 48 hours later that already or 24 hours later that already kicks in and they're producing so the, the complicated answer is like, no, you're wrong, but you're right. So because when we think about absolute amount, right? Because in a cockatiel, one milliliter is already a huge amount of blood, right? So yeah, you have very small patients, so you can only lose a small amount. But in considering to their body weight, they can actually withstand significantly higher blood loss. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm kind of thinking like when people use that catchphrase, like you eat like a bird, when they try to mean like you don't eat very much, when in birds, in fact, eat a lot. Right? Like yeah, yeah, because I mean, think about it. So that's, that's the beauty of it. The, the more you kind of like then think about it, like, well, 
like if you have a heart rate of like 500, like a little parakeet, right? Your, your metabolic rate is like on steroids. I mean, you, 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 and you think about it, the, the temperature, the, the core temperature of a bird is like 180 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, right? So it's significantly higher. So you have this little reactor that, you know, that like that heart goes like, it has to heat up this amazing amount. So the difference between your core body temperature of your little parakeet or a macaw to room temperature, which is 75, is significantly higher than those two little dogs that are sleeping right there at 98 or something like this, right? So, and the heart rate is significantly slower. So if I have, I always say these, these little animals, they're like Grand Prix racing engines, right? Their engines go, they, they always have these RPMs of like 12,000 versus my little car or whatever, you know, you don't want to bring it above 5,000 because the engine goes bust, but they go through a lot of fuel because that little heart needs to move, that little, you know, that wing needs to fly. It's a huge caloric, caloric um, demand on these little systems. So you're absolutely right. Eat like a bird means, oh, he can eat four pizzas. Nice. <laughs> All right. And Dr. Mara, can you, is, uh, can you, can you um, run us through any current research you're doing now? Uh, uh, do any work on avian, um, oh gosh, ganglioritis, kind of, for example? Uh, ganglioritis? Nice yeah, no. So, so, uh, so let's just quickly, uh, uh, like a little bit overview of how research is being done. So there is, there's very different branches of research. Um, and so one of them, a lot of times is often referred to as benchtop research. And the other one is kind of like, if you, if, if you lump it, um, is kind of like uh, clinical research. So when you do basic research, benchtop research, kind of like um, you basically start out with a question that you have. It's like, hey, we identified this problem. Let's go back to our example with the cardiac medication. So, hey, we have this medication. We know it does this and this and this on the heart. You know, it works on this and this. So theoretically, it should work on the avian heart because the mechanism is kind of like the same. So can we use this in avian? So this is kind of like a fundamental question that nobody knows the answer. So what you want to do is you want to actually use a whole bunch of healthy birds, right? And this could be, this could be a colony of 50, cockatoos or conures or they need to have a certain body weight because usually we want to take repeated blood samples or we want to do something so this is why having a cockatiel research you know it's like yeah can you do this but it kind of limits how much resource so that's why a lot of stuff is also done on chickens right so this is why maybe that heart medication maybe it's going to be first tried on chicken because we can take so much blood from a chicken you know because they're hefty and so then you have let's let's use chickens you know uh then we have 20 chickens that get that medication. We have 20 chickens that get like the placebo, right? That get either, if we give it orally, they get gavashed with the same amount of volume. So they get caught up every day. They experience the same amount of handling, the same amount of stress. They get, they get tubes, they got, you know, but it's a sham medication, right? So it's just water or sugar solution. So that's the placebo. And then you start taking blood, right? Uh, and then you look at your data, you analyze and it says, hey, like did actually the heart rate significantly change? Is there, is there a clinical change or is the heart rate exactly the same with the ones that got medicated or the ones that, uh, that didn't? You could use Lipitor, right? So you could say, hey, Lipitor, if we give it to 20 of these animals and 20 to these animals, and then we look, we bleed them every other day and look at cholesterol levels, are the chickens on the Lipitor, have they lower cholesterol levels than the one that we gave the sugar solution or water solution, right? So this would be that basic kind of research. And then there's this clinical research where you basically say, huh, wow, look at this. We have a macaw with a squamous cell carcinoma or you know, it has this disease. It has Borna virus. It has already been diagnosed with this and this disease. And, you know, all the stuff that we have is currently pretty frustrating because the, the drugs that work in a dog and cat with an osteosarcoma or that work with this and this and that, it's just not working. 
you know, instead of getting years and years of being able to cure that animal, either it's not doing anything or it's, it's maybe making the life better for two weeks. So now you could talk to the owner and say, listen, here's the deal. Unfortunately, your pet got diagnosed with this and this disease. If this would be a cat, I would use this. If it would be a dog, I would use this medication. Unfortunately, we don't really have good data on that. However, my thinking is it should work or we can use that medication and we can use maybe radiation or we can use some other modality. Would you be willing to let us do this with the understanding that we are going into new, new land, right? We are, we are going into uncharted territory here. That's considered clinical research. And between the two branches, um, that is a little bit more where my heart is. Um, I like to, I, 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 I like that challenge of, of like, all right, we have that, we have that bad diagnosis now, you know, we don't have anything on our shelf that we can quickly take off. Let's brainstorm. Let's, you know, so then I can go to the oncologist. I can go to the surgeon. I can go to this and this person say, Hey, what would you do if this would be a cat diagnosed with this? And so I bring, I bring the diagnostic uh, you know, details like there was a biopsy or imaging and say, like, hey, what could we do? And then we'll sit together and says, hey, you know, it's like, I don't know. It's like, I know, I don't know either. But, you know, it's like, let's look and do research on how does the drug work? What would be a similar drug? Has this been used before, maybe in a different species? And so that's a little bit more what I like to do. And so, um, so and then recently I had a student come up to me and say, hey, Dr. Mai, I really want to, you know, be an exotic veterinarian. Like what, uh, what do I need to do to increase my chances to potentially get into a training program like a residency? And, you know, I said, well, one of the, one of the best ways to get into a program is have your own publication that you already have worked on a problem, have been part of a research team. And, you know, you have, you have been able to collect data, analyze data and write it up for a manuscript. So that's a little bit our currency when you look at academic you know, academic market, because we get so many people that apply for these, for these positions. How do you pick out? Because they're all stellar in school. They all have, they all are great. They all, their interest is great. They all love it. They all have experience. But then what's that extra little thing that pushes maybe that one applicant over the top? And it's like having, having gone through something like this. And so one of these students came to me and said, Hey, yeah, you know, and she said, I want to do something, you know, like that. And I was like, Hey, why don't we look at all these birds that have been coming through the emergency service where they were diagnosed with egg binding, right? And so let's look, let's look at more example, maybe the blood work. Let's look, was there something in hindsight that if we look at all of these cases where we see, oh my God, why didn't we see this? Because maybe Wednesday's egg binding day. No. <laughs> Just kidding. Right. But, um, but so, and, and so we did this, we worked, uh, with Dr. With Dr. Brian Spear actually, uh, in Oakland and he has so many cases. So, and he has his computer system, uh, uh, yeah, his, all his cases computerized. So his intern, uh, you know, and my student got together and they said, here's the questions that we are asking. Here's the outcome that we're after. Let's do the statistics. And so we are actually just working through the paper. So I don't want to, I don't want to spill the beans before it's out there, but you know, it's interesting. It's really interesting data that, that, you know, as a private practitioner, like Dr. Spears, see so many cases that he has so much data sitting around that, you know, he is so happy to have somebody like a student, like take this data and look at it. Is there a pattern, right? And, and so that's kind of like how I like to do. And so we're just actually, uh, yesterday, um, I just read through a very rough, uh, stage of the manuscript. So we're doing still statistics. It's going back and forth. And the more you look through that script, the more answers it needs to be fine tuned. So it's kind of like, a, you know, it's kind of like chiseling a stature out of, out of, out of stone, you know, kind of like uh michelangelo said that you know when he was being asked like oh my god how, how did you how did you produce this beautiful david stature you know how did you you must be a maestro you must be amazing and he said no 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 the david was always in the stone i just had to chisel away the stuff that was outside. genius answer so that's that 
Right. That's how that's how I look at it a little bit. Like the answer, you know, the answer is a lot of times sitting right on somebody's desk because they have medical records that we just need to chisel it away and need to find a pattern. And so that's what I like to do. So that's one of our latest projects. Oh, that's awesome. And I think I, you touched on a really uh, good point is that um, a lot of, it seems almost as a necessity, but in a, in a um, exotics medicine in particular is the amount of collaboration and, and picking of the brains you have with other veterinar avian veterinarians and exotic vets. And, um, and then the big annual event, which they recently had was the exotics con um, where you guys all come together and do a lot of one-on-one uh, -on -one discussing. I'm sure these, these cases like the one you're talking about now, Spear. Uh, yeah, exactly. And that would be, that would be something that when, you know, when we are at the stage, so I, I told the students like she needs to present this data at the next year, exotic con, right? So, so uh, that's all stuff that I think needs to be shared uh, with, with our colleagues, right? Uh, it needs to go into the, in the, in the literature, because again, if we are able to put our finger on something, you know, it makes sense then for people to know about it because that all makes us better. I mean, that's, that's how we all learn. That's why we go to conference to figure out what other people have been, uh, have been researching. And, and like I said, the day, unfortunately, is not long enough for us to be experts in everything, right? So everybody has a little pet peeve, what they like to do, um, you know, and that's great because they are focusing, uh, you know, very strongly in that area. Um, and so, but then we have these meetings and then you publish in a journal and then you read that journal and, you know, you're like, hey, wait a second, I have this case, but I remember two years ago, there was this, there was this paper that was presented about egg binding. Let me just quickly, I don't, I didn't memorize it, but I know where to look and, and I'm like, oh, look, you know, so, so that's, wow. that's how the community grows and, you know, that's how the pets benefit from that. Yeah, no, for my years at Bird Talk Magazine, I, I had the, uh, the, the, the great luxury of going to a few of the exotic cons. Um, and I tell you, just the, the thing that I really enjoyed when I went to those is the excitement I would see um, with the avian vets, just like outside the um, the lecture halls, just coming up with these ideas on, you know, like just, you know, writing things down on napkins almost to the point where just like that, that exchange of information is so exciting. And just to see how passionate that these you know, a lot of these veterinarians have for their you know it's it's something that they're very passionate about and it's very inspiring to see so that was that was definitely yeah inspiring. i mean i mean you're describing the scene perfectly that's that's really uh, it's a really true uh and valid observation that you made i mean literally writing on the background i mean some of my stuff literally you know i mean like at even at uga like where we are this big family right and and i was at a fourth of july party from one of my faculty colleagues and and I was standing on the porch and I had a beer in my hand and I was this other guy that I haven't seen, right? And so he has a beer and I was like, cheers. And we're chatting a little bit and and so it's like, what um what are you what are you doing? And he's like, Well, I'm you know, I'm working with uh, da, 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 and I'm mainly working with birds. I'm like, You're working with birds? Well, well <laughs> how come I don't you know, it's like, what? You know, and so it turns out that he's an immunotoxicologist. And he does a lot of research in, in, in lead poisoning. So, and which, you know, gets, uh, gets obviously a lot of attention from the human, uh, from the human side. So, um, and they're looking at basically what they're doing is they're looking at how lead toxicity affects the next generation, right? So, uh, which is kind of interesting. So basically the maternal effect. So if a mother is basically contaminated, lives in a house, and with the human research, right? That drives all this. If somebody, if a mother lives in a house, in an older house where lead paint was used, where, where you know, in a city where the fumes are just like heavily loaded with lead. And so what potentially does effect, does this have on the fetus? And so they're, they're doing this with birds, with pigeons and stuff. So, you know, one of these, and it's like, and so now we have been publishing quite a bunch of papers together because it literally happened over a beer, right? And, and, and it's like, oh my God, your interest kind of complements mine. And so, and so this is why I think these, um, these uh, meetings can never be really fully replaced by Zoom meetings, you know? So can we, can we distribute information, disseminate information? having big Zoom meetings with 120, you know, 200 people sitting there. But I mean, there's still something missing and like exactly that scene, like you go to exhibit hall or maybe you meet for a beer at the bar mm -hmm. and, and then you stand and talk about it and projects get hammered out of that. So that's, that's the beauty of these yearly conferences that just a, a screen meeting is just not um, uh, possible.
Nice. And that, uh, so just uh, that kind of segues nicely with our webinar for next Friday. We're going to have um, Dr. Lamb on with us, and she's going to give us the behind the scenes look at the most recent exotics home. So um, we'll be talking about this uh, in depth next Friday. Uh, so, Good stuff. yeah. So, um, okay. So that was a fascinating look. And just real quick, I did have someone ask, and I, I, I've been wanting to ask you this. Have you ever treated a penguin? So that's where my last question yeah. for you. Yeah, <laughs> actually, while I was, yeah, while I was doing, uh, while I was working in the zoo, they had a lot of penguins there. And, and the, big, the big deal with penguins anywhere is aspergillosis. Okay. So, um, you know, because we all know where penguins come from, from really cold places, right? And so, um, the, there is not a lot of trees where they grow. There's not a lot of leaf litter where they grow. A uh, grow, live. Penguins grow. Well, they do grow. But I mean, yeah, right. So they're living in a, in a very kind of like, um, if you want to, kind of close to sterile environment regarding that. So the immune system doesn't seem to be um, super tolerant of the of aspergillosis, which is just a fungal pathogen that's every that's everywhere, right? And so, I mean, I live in the woods. I go with my dogs for a walk every day. So you know, we kick up leaf litter because we're jolly and we're having fun. And so, but every time you kick up the leaf litter, right, you're aerosolizing these fungal spores. And I'm pretty sure that if somebody would stick an endoscope in my lung and in my dog's lungs and everything and 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 take a little bit and you, you could probably get aspergillus spores out of there but as long as i'm healthy and happy my immune system keeps that in in a checkmate position for penguins unfortunately aspergillus seems to be really over overpowering uh, uh, uh their immune system and so a lot of facilities that have penguins, zoos, aquarium, they actually do have it uh, on long-term itraconazole, which is an antifungal medication. So, so yeah, um, yeah, penguins was kind of like our headache at the zoo, oh. so yeah. Okay, that is fascinating. Um, wow, I did not know any of that. So thank you. I'm sure a lot of people got a whole lot of information about penguins and their health. That's incredible, that's incredible. Wow, cool. thank you. <laughs> so, um, and penguins really smell like fish really badly. So Do they really? Good. Oh, well, yeah, because that's what they eat and then they poop, fish poop out and then they're like, yeah, so I, I, a lot of people romanticize penguins. One of our texts is like, I love penguins, it's their favorite thing. It's like, yeah, but uh, like that. <laughs> there you go. There's your first uh, the, the vet insider um, tidbit on penguins that you probably didn't know A lot about. of people hate me now, probably. No, yeah. we destroyed my romantic picture of a penguin. Oh, Boy. they're so cute. Uh, yeah, yeah. Dr. Mary. Yeah. Thank you. That was awesome. Appreciate it. And um, yeah, we got to have you back on because this is um, this is information that you don't read anywhere. So um, well, maybe before you do this, before you commit it, maybe you want to read through the comments because no, they're comments. Fascinating oh. presentation. I'm looking at them all oh. popping up. Very interesting. Oh, these are all like, okay. yeah, these are all great. Oh, cool. Yeah. All so right, thank cool. you. And I didn't and pay anybody of them. No, well, well, I, we'll, we'll go through the list later and make sure there's no connection with you. And okay, <laughs> uh, no, no, seriously, a lot of, a lot of wonderful messages popping up here. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Meyer. I'm going to announce our winner of our giveaway. They're going to get um, uh, some, uh, our giveaway is going to be the La Fibre popcorn Nutriberries, which is super fun for birds to eat. And you can watch a movie with your bird. They can eat the, they can eat their popcorn Nutriberries. You can have your human popcorn and you guys can, Chillax. And then, um, so today's uh, giveaway is going to go out to Diana D. So congratulations, I'm sorry, Diane D. Uh, congratulations, uh, Diane. Someone from the Lafibre office will contact you to send that. And also another package of your um, Lafibre food of your bird's choice. So I'm gonna, um, I am going to play the video for um, the popcorn nutrients. Dr. Mara, thanks again. We're gonna go out on the video. This will be our, our credit. Wait, wait, credits. wait. Yes. I just want to show quickly my dogs. Oh, oh my look gosh. Girls. Look at them. They were so brave. They didn't interrupt. The, they were, the they, were <laughs> they are just sleeping like happy dogs there. How'd you do that? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Lucky, lucky, lucky. All right. That was very, thank you. All right. Have All a right. good one. All right, guys. All right, thank uh, everybody for tuning in. Yes. Thank you. That was fascinating. And I, I, I'm sure we're going to have to have you on again very, very soon. Okay. I know I can play this proper. Ah, I did this before. Come on. There we go. Okay. Promise. There we go. All right. This is the popcorn experience. Uh, uh, 
Um, so Dr. Murray, thank you again. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Um, we're already in uh, October. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Where's the year go? Uh, in the meantime, everybody, until we have you on again, Dr. Uh, Meyer, hopefully very soon. Um, everyone have a great weekend. All the best to you in your block and stay safe. Bye.